That reside inside my soul And each one wants to things different How can I love intertwined flames Yet their own bodies lie separate Between the Saifa and Marwa Enchained in a painful moment Hussein calls for him whilst Abbas Cries for the women in the tent Both voices break apart his mind One lies left by is trampled the other's voice never ending forgive me master i failed hussein oh abbas hussein oh. i think everyone associates themselves with a certain identity so people for example can be doctors and they identify themselves with healing people and curing people some people have an identity with media, so they capture people's moments and capture people's memories and they put it into a media format or a video format and give it to them. For me, my identity, how I identify myself on this planet is getting this message of, of, of the Ahlul Bayt, getting the message of the Prophet, getting the message of Islam and putting it into a poetic format and giving it to the people so that I attempt to bring man closer to God through poetry means. It's here that Adam still watches, fearful of turning away. For he who loved the beginning must remain to watch the end, enticed by the road that he walks in love. The seconds prolong, the minutes attempt to stand still, simply to enjoy the trend. It is a love that not all know. It is a love that not all know. Not all remain till the end. And unless you complete this road, how I started was when I was a young child, I would usually listen to eulogies and recitations from the elder generation. Now the elder generation, their, their rituals were very set and, and um, the matem was very set. Uh, what I mean by set is that it was very ongoing and it was kind of hundreds of years um, seen as any matem. So I would listen to uh, loads of matems and, and recitations and really connect with the message of Muhammad through emotive means, like I said. Um, and I started from a young age. I would recite at home, uh, within my family, within family gatherings I would recite. I would do what I, it's, it's as simple as copying the eulogies of uh, of those who were obviously uh, very much established, the poets and reciters who were established, I would just copy what they would do in front of my family. Um, once or twice my father told, uh, you know, took me to, to house programs. I would recite now, so from the house, from my own family, to house majalis or, or house programs. That's exactly where uh, I would, again, copy the recitations and, and uh, recite in front of a small crowd. Um, Alhamdulillah, I think I was uh, very much supported by certain personalities within my community who saw a talent, let's just say, in me uh, and, and gave me the opportunity or the platform to be able to recite in front of the masses uh, in programs and events and conferences and so on and so forth. Um, it just picked up. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't really taught or schooled on how to recite. My mother was a reciter, which, was, you know, which helped a lot. Uh, my father was a lecturer as well. So again, this, this, this household uh, of lamentations uh, is a household which I grew up in. So it was part and parcel, very much deep-rooted within my mind, um, the, the message of Imam Hussain and commemorating the message of Imam Hussain So naturally I grew up um, in this atmosphere of lamentations and eulogies. With Muhammad something was born, beautiful until it's end, he shames the world for the better, setting the stage for Ali after him, 
he told me so the us tour uh, it's um essentially last year we, we, me and brother nori sadar we went um to the east coast of america so we went to places like orlando um dearborn toronto uh, new york new jersey these places what we did was we just wanted to establish uh, a recitation and poetry atmosphere within america now we understand coming from london that poetry is now uh, you know a standard part of a program poetry and recitation is definitely a standard part of the program but we just felt that america um kind of lacked in that atmosphere so what we did was we just wanted to test the waters basically when it comes um, to poetry and recitations and how they how they received it now i think personally alhamdulillah they received it very well based on the reaction based on the feedback that we got um, so we went across these different places technically the way it worked was we go to each organization we do a program, we stay the night, and we go to different pro uh, a different city, stay the night, do a program, and so on and so forth. So essentially what we're doing this year is to solidify what we know and give them as techniques and solidify the fact that poetry and recitation, number one, has a very deep uh, position within Islam. Uh, and number two, that the just to inspire the people there, inspire them to love the Ahlul Bayt, through poetry and recitations because that's the only thing I can do and that's the only thing Brother Nuri can do I'm not going to go and do videos because I don't know how to record videos I'm not going to go there and do lectures because probably I don't know how to do lectures but what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going there to recite and going there to disseminate the message of the Ahl Bayt through reciting forms uh, and to really engage the audience and really engage the audience and bring about their participation inspiring them to love the Ahl Bayt through poetic forms now what we're doing there is we're going again we're going through different cities on the east coast but as well as reciting in a program we are going to solidify their what, what we know uh, in terms of the techniques uh, in terms of performance in terms of reciting in terms of poems in terms of rhythm in terms of rhyme uh, all of the techniques of poetry and recitation and put it into a workshop so that they can really benefit and get something tangible out of the experience of poetry and recitations assalamu alaikum my name is jawad al-hari and i'm the manager of this us tour the role includes uh, organizing and arranging all the logistics behind the tour. So we're talking about about eight months, eight to nine months worth of planning, uh, getting, getting in contact with various cities, various host programs that want to invite uh, the brothers to, to their cities, to their centers. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done behind the scenes to, to ensure that this you know, goes according to plan and runs smoothly. Um, the crux of it is basically sorting out all the logistics. So Ali, when he goes to these cities, all he has to concentrate on is his 15, 20, 25 minutes, however long he's on stage, doing what he does best. Everything behind the scenes, from airports to accommodation, everything behind the scene is organized and arranged by myself. Ali is a very good friend of mine. I've known him for 20 odd years, and we have been doing this in a professional role, friendship aside, for about three, four years now. Um, in regards to organizing events and arranging future projects, albeit uh, albums or you know videos coming up to recitations and invitations to various different locations. Um, so it's good because we've got the friendship element as a foundation that we've had for years, um, but it's nice to work in a different kind of uh, arrangement and it's nice to work in an arrangement which is a lot more professional and a lot more uh, invigorating. In terms of the in terms of the history uh, of lamentations and recitations, I think we need to go back um, to pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, Islamic Arabia, and then obviously there's modern history as well. Uh, Arabs in in whatever history book you find, Arabs were known as poets. Um, it was their culture. They would uh, speak about their values and traits to other tribes. They would also condemn other tribes uh, and attack other tribes through poetry, through means of language, and through poetic forms. Um, this was pre-Islamic. Now, 
the, the miracle of the Quran, as we know, is the language of the Quran. It spoke directly to the people. The same way all the prophets had their own miracles. So for example, Prophet Moses uh, had the miracle of magic. The Prophet Isa had the miracle of medicine. Because at that time, medicine was prevalent within society. At that time, uh, magic was prevalent within society. So in order to connect with the audience there, in order to connect with the nation there, he had to speak their language. So Moses spoke the language of magic. Jesus spoke the language of medicine, uh, and so on and so forth, until he reached the language of the Arabs pre-Islamic, uh, pre-Islam pre was the language of poetry. And so the Quran uh, came as a, as, as a poetic form so that people could understand and really revere the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through poetic forms. Now, it's very interesting to note that the first word that was given to the Prophet, or he was ordered to recite, was in fact recite, iqra. Iqra, derived in the Arabic form, is qara. Qara uh, uh, is translated to recite. So it's interesting to know that the, the Quran itself comes in two, two forms. Uh, the written scripture and the recited text. And the way we know it as, is, uh, is Quran, as, uh, is, is, is in its recital form. Now, the first word that the, the Prophet was ordered to say was iqra. And so he, he read in the name of uh, his, his Lord. So the Prophet, uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he would always encourage poetry, uh, especially poetry where it uh, spoke about the values and, uh, and the lessons of Islam. Of, of Islam. But he was, always con he was always very careful to condemn poetry, which talked about bigotry and, and chivalry and, uh, and lust and corruption. He made a very, you know, a very distinct uh, distinction between the two. Now, Bring this back to, to, to the initial uh, question of the history of recitation. Um, it slowly moved on to the fact that uh, poetry, like I said, poetry was very much uh, a formidable presence within pre-Islamic Arabia. The Quran came and now we have the uh, Islamic Empire. So when, once the Quran came, everyone knew about poetry, everyone recited poetry and everyone recited the Quran through a poetic form. But then in terms of the Shia uh, tradition, or the, I should say, the, the Shia heritage of poetry and lamentations. And let's not forget what we see today isn't exactly what we saw 14 centuries ago. What we see today uh, is is a derivement of the culture or or, or the cultural uh, expansion from the initial concept. Now, the initial concept of lamentation and poetry, or poetry recitation in, in the name of Imam Hussein is. Um, uh, as a direct response or emotive response to Imam Hussein's message. The reason behind initially uh, getting involved in this tour is because there was a very clear need. Um, I think one of the fundamental reasons why it feels so important is because there's a lack within uh, the States, especially not so much Europe and London, but especially within the States for English poetry. Um, it is, of course, targeting a new audience and it is, of course, the language of the youth. Um, a lot of first generation Muslims, you know, they might come from the Middle East, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, um, but the youth all speak the universal language of English. So we wanted to use this uh, to our benefit to try and spread the message of Ahlul Bayt and spread the message of Imam Hussain alayhi salam to the youth and there wasn't a better way than English poetry. <laughs> For me, it's just this one person, this one me as a, as a person commemorating with the millions. It's that's that's the real honor for me because um, you know at the end of the day we want to be. At the end of the day, we see Imam Hussein as a person who um, will be able to to testify on our behalf and be able to uh, really intercede on our behalf. So the more we give for uh, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we give for the Ahlul Bayt, the more hopefully we have a chance 
of salvation on the Day of Judgment. And through these personalities, I, I sincerely believe that through these personalities, the more we give them, towards these personalities, they won't let you down on the Day of Judgment. Um, so for one person, just to be collect in, in this collective millions, that's for me like a, a, a great deal. But not only that, but I can have that added privilege to be able to make people really get closer to Imam Hussein through, the, uh, through their tears and through their hearts and really connect with their hearts, that again is an added privilege for me. Because I think it's a, uh, it's a way of, uh, of a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's, he's blessed me with, the, with the, the, the minimum talents that I have. To make people cry for Imam Hussein, that for me is, is a real privilege. Um, and the, 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 the scriptures or the, the hadiths always encourage poets and reciters to recite for Imam Hussein. And why? Because you spread the message of, of Imam Hussein amongst the masses. I think if there wasn't a benefit, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even envisage uh, taking time out of our, our lives to go there if there wasn't going to be that benefit. I think first and foremost, especially coming back from last year, last year it was just relaying that, relaying how poetry works, what goes on, the, the art behind poetry and especially English poetry. This year it is a chance for us to inspire that further development, because we did the sort of the ground the groundwork and the foundations. Now we're looking to build. Now we're looking to to get them involved. Uh, the great thing about it is that Ali's po Ali's recitations and where he's coming from, with the English poetry uh, that comes from Nouri Saradar, it inspires a lot of people, and they're very much very popular uh, artists, if you want to call it that within the States. So getting them there, that's going to automatically inspire a lot of people. That's automatically going to create a buzz and a hype, which is what we want. A lot of youth, and this is something that we need to address as a community, they come to Majalis 10 days, uh, 10 days in Muharram. They might come to the mosques in Ramadan, but throughout the year, there isn't that link with the Ahl Bayt. There's that fundamental link that's missing. And we want to try, when they see these recitations, these workshops, these poetry uh, reciters doing their stuff, they of, you know, they come closer, you know, it allows them to, allows us to attract them and pull them in. Um, and I think if we can get them having that love of Ahlul Bayt and being inspired by that love of Ahlul Bayt through poetry throughout the way, yeah, then inshallah it will be successful. And that's the aim. <laughs> I think, I think the underlying factor is that a lot of the youth out there, they grow up with so many external influences that sometimes they have no control of. Most of the time they have no control of. What I mean by external influences, for example, and I'll be real here, they have, um, you know, the West drumming into their minds they have to be a, a certain shape. The West drumming in their minds that celebrities are the way forward. You have to dress like a celebrity, you have to talk like a celebrity, you have to listen to music, you have to drink the alcohol, you have to be in these parties. This is the way of a normal person. That's what we've been shaped. And unfortunately, this is what the youth have been uh, fed and this is what the youth have been growing up into. This is the environment that the youth have been growing up, to, up into. Now, how do we tackle these issues? We can either tackle it by saying, this is all haram, no, 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 no. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. But then you'll get a rebel youth, the, 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 the youth of rebel say, well, all of my friends are doing this. How comes I can't? I know there's this thing called Islam. And I know there's, a, the, you know there's laws and stuff, but for me, it's unpractical. And it's, it's impractical to me. I, I can't understand the logic behind it. These are the questions that the youth will ask. And these are the questions that the youth will pose to us. Now, us as the, next, uh, as the, as the generation now, we've got to teach the next generation that, yes, there are external influences. You may go through those external influences. You may fall into this trap, 
But at the end of the day, we want to highlight to you what you'll see at the end of the and at the end at the end of this road is something which isn't beneficial for you. It'll leave you empty-minded. It'll leave your heart empty. You'll be chasing dreams for the rest of your life. You'll be chasing this vision for the rest of your life. And there's nothing tangible out this. What we will give to them is the fact that Islam is the answer by giving them tangible means to connect to Islam. How? Through recitation and poetry. Because the way we're going to shape this and the way we're going to uh, deliver it to them is a very attractive form. It's an enjoying experience. It's uh, an experience where people will clap and they will sing together, remembering the Ahlul Bayt. It's an, an, it's an experience where people can shout and really be inspired by the Ahlul Bayt through poetry and recitations. So first and foremost, we've been invited to Ummah. Ummah this year, like last year, is in uh, Debon, Michigan, which is a very Middle Eastern, uh, Lebanese, Iraqi-based area in America. Uh, I think there's 50,000 plus uh, Iraqis and Lebanese. Very, very nice area. So much so that you've got the big American flats where, you know, next to your American flag, you've got the Hussein flag. Um, so very nice area, a lot of Middle Eastern Arabic speakers. Uh, so that's where we set camp, that's where the base is. After that, we're going to Brampton, which is a much smaller community, uh, primarily Khaja and Pakistani based community. Uh, we are going to an event in Brampton, so similar to last year. Beautiful community, beautiful youth community. The nice thing about that is that it's run purely by the youth. Um, so it gives them to the, the, the chance to sort of stretch their wings and try and arrange these kind of events. Um, after that, we're going to a new city, which we didn't go to last year, uh, Chicago. We've got an event in Chicago, um, which is very exciting. Um, then we go to our friend Ali Sachu in Orlando. Very much looking forward to that. The Orlando community of HRC and the Jama'a, they're a beautiful bunch and they're doing a lot in regards to progress. They're very much very on the ball and they know where their aim is. They've got their five-year plan and they know where they want to be at. So we applaud that and we encourage that and inshallah we're looking forward to our time there. Highlights for me, probably meeting, uh, seeing all the people that we got to know last year. So for every city we went to, there was a host that looked after us. Uh, in Canada, we had the Juwan family. In Orlando, we had Ali Sachu, for example. So everywhere, of course, in Debon, we had Ali Najaf, Munti Mawla, all of these. So they are friends that, you know, we've got a relationship over in the past year. So I'm looking forward to seeing them. Undoubtedly, it's going to be one of the, the highlights. Um, but at the same time, it's nice to get sort of entrenched within their communities because every community is very different. That's one thing I've realized in regards to America. Uh, every community and every state is completely different. Like if you try and compare sort of the, the Jama'a in New York and the Jama'a in Orlando, completely different. Um, so it's nice to get a different little mix of, of what's going on in every single state and every single community. I mean, this is going to be very interesting because now that we've established what um, poetry and recitations are, through the work over the last year that me and Brother Nuri have done. Now it's really going up a level uh, and really through the workshops, that's, what we want, that's the main work that we want to do. The workshops are the, uh, are the real message that we want to give. The programs are just another program where people can enjoy the experience of recitations and poetry. But the workshops, these are where we want to get our, our true message across to the people. This is where we want to say, you know, you can work on, on performance, stage performance, on how to use your vocal cords, on how to, to recite, on, on, on your eye contact, on your breathing, on poetry, on rhythm, on rhyme. All of these little experiences, all these little lessons we want to give to them in the poetry uh, workshop so that they can really solidify what they learn from, 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 from us. Now, I'm a bit worried because the, the preparation hasn't gone too well, but uh, hopefully over the last couple, for the next couple of days, uh, I'll really uh, bring together everything that I know in a, in a workshop format. It's not going to be lectures and, and, and it's not going to be like you know an hour discussion. It'll be very uh, interactive. There'll be lots of exercises. There'll be breathing exercises. There'll be singing exercises. I think people uh, will, will really enjoy it because of the fact that we have something different to offer this year. These are the words written in tears. Let them to you paint an image. These are the words written in tears. Let them to you paint an image. When Jabir comes to Karbala, which body does he first visit? Hussein or Abbas? Hussein or Abbas? From the ink that flows in my pen to blood that flows in Karbala, let these words rest within your mind. As to you I paint a picture, this land with bodies is ridden. This land with bodies is ridden and steps upon this sand. Jabir, yet his...
basically we're here for the sound test. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not, but here we're for the sound test uh, for this year's Umar convention. Uh, the first night is the opening ceremony. We're going to be doing a duet, me and brother Nuri Sardar. Um, I'm going to be at the end of the hall down there. He's going to start off on the pulpit. I'm going to gradually make my way down towards the pulpit as we recite the duet. Um, Saturday is going to be Wafat Imam al so I've got a little piece regarding the Imam. Sunday is going to be a bit different. The clapping is going to be very different to, to your normal uh, your, your normal program. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to be uh, because it's a bit of an untested crowd. We tested them last year, they're good with the solid clapping but this is going to be way different to what they've, they've had last year. So uh, I'm a bit anxious but I'm confident that they can pull it off. So um, hopefully it goes well. Hopefully it goes well. Rosa, Rosa. Are you getting it? Yeah, you getting it. Okay. Um, so tell me what the conference means to you. I feel like this conference is a... Uh... <laughs> 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 My name is Hakir Safa, and from this workshop that we had at the UMA convention this year in Dearborn, Michigan, I learned that we should express ourselves through poetry or whichever artistic characteristic that we may have to kind of use that to spread the, the message of the Ahlul Bayt Ali. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hidayah Dawi. I live in Maryland. to express yourself and the love for Ahlul Bayt and I appreciated being here in order to learn from people who are established poets who are well recognized and um, to be able to get tips from them on how to better ourselves as poets and how to carry on the message of Ahlul Bayt through whatever talent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with and that's a very important point that was made in this workshop so I appreciate that a lot because because even if your talent is not poetry, there is some special talent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and it is up to you to find it, to better the world and to advance the cause of Ahlul Bayt inshallah. Personally for me, poetry is something I can express my love for the Ahlul Bayt Instead of the music that is displayed in the West that used to describe things that are very materialistic and that something that we cannot really strive for or there's no point in striving for. Poetry helps me express my love for the Ahlul Bayt and actually get to their message and try to propagate it in a way that people want to listen to it in a different way, a different way than the original way which has kind of lost its meaning with the way of today. Well, the thing with the negative negativity that's coming out of the West is um, being a Muslim, Islam always gives alternatives. My father always gives the example of if you can't drink alcohol, you can drink juice. So um, if you can't listen to music, you can listen to um, the ruqmiyat and the recitations of people like Mullah Ali Fadl. And um, you know, ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He knows how we're wired, he knows how we work. And so if he tells us that these things are detrimental to our physiology or spirituality, it's up to us to listen and to obey and to go towards the things that bring us closer to him because ultimately that's what's going to help us gain his pleasure inshallah. So um, the media and the musicians and things like that don't bother me as much because there are always alternatives to whatever filth is being produced. For anyone who's interested in poetry but is not sure if they want to do it or not, I highly recommend that they try it and to see where they're weak and where they're strong and the strong aspects of poetry that they appear to be, they should just kind of focus on that aspect and kind of elevate from there. And then when they have reached that point where they can focus on their weaknesses, then they can elevate themselves from there as well. One thousand years and yet in everything The Ummah Convention is, a, is an annual conference in which they highlight um, different teachings of a different personality. So for example, last year it was the Conference of Ali. 
Uh, the Conference of Ali was a holistic approach in all of the social, economical uh, and uh, political issues of the Shia uh, within the Western world through the eyes of Imam Ali alayhi salam. This year, the Conference of Muhammad fell on the Islamic calendar of the Mab'ath of the Prophet, meaning the, uh, the day he was assigned prophethood, let's just say. Um, so it was, a, again, a holistic approach of Shia affairs through um, socio sociological uh, discussions, um, uh, political discussions and uh, economical discussions of the Shia world. Many uh, great speakers from around the world all congregated in this um, area. Uh, in which uh, they were set up on workshops uh, every single day from, from about 10 a.m. all the way to 6 p.m. Um, discussing again various different topics but at night there was always uh, either a celebration or a commemoration which was open to the public you get thousands of people attending. The difference between this year's Ummah Convention and last year's Ummah Convention is the fact that last year was an introduction of poetry and recitations to the American audiences. So in a sense, there was no expectations from us. Um, we could, um, you know, uh, we didn't have anything to lose. We just went there and did what we do best, and that's recite poetry. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, there was a very good response, and that's why we were invited next year to the same Ummah conference. But this year, we thought, me and Brother Nuri Sardar, we thought we had to do something different this year. We can't just go up on stage and just recite poetry because this year the interesting thing, especially from a reciter point of view, was the fact that there were two other top level reciters attending the Ummah Convention in Nazar Qatari and Abad al-Halwaji. Now, for me, they have their audience and they have that interest and they have that different spark. Uh, so it's very difficult from, from an English point of view to recite to an, an, a predominantly Arab crowd and try to interest them into English poetry, especially if there are top-level Arab, Arab reciters. So we came up with the, of the idea of doing a duet. So the first day, um, they called up our names and, and funnily enough, I told them specifically that when, when, you call up, when you call our names up, don't put the spotlight on me. I'm going to be standing at the back. So this is, this, this is the idea that we had. I'll stand at the back, nobody will go at the front, he'll start the poetry and then bam, I come into it right in the middle of it. Uh, and, and, and you know, give it another dimension. But as soon as I stood there and they called up our names, boom, the spotlight came on me. And then I, I turned around thinking, at that time no one was really looking at me, but they were a bit confused why there was one light on Nuri and one light in, like, at the back. So I kind of turned away just to make myself like, not appear to be there. And I, and I spoke to one of my managers and told them, cut the light, cut the light, because the, the, you know, the whole plan was ruined. Alhamdulillah, within three or four seconds, they cut the light and then Nuri started his poetry. As soon as the light came on me, when I started the poetry, everyone's interests were like, whoa, what's going on? There's another voice here, but we can't see him on stage. So that's the added dimension that we created for, them, for the audience to be enticed by the English poetry. And this is exactly what we're trying to focus on, something different, something out, uh, out of the box, you know, out of the, uh, yeah, out of the box kind of. Uh, initiative. So that kind of worked on the first night. For the second night, um, again, I had this interest of doing something different. So what I did was, prior to coming to Ummah, I searched um, some background instrumentals, but the instrumentals were what's called ahat. So just ha 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 Those ahat, which were studified to, to be a melody. I searched one and I, and I searched one up and I, and I, and I saved it. Uh, and then what I did was I got the English words and I recited on top of the ahat. So when I am reciting, there's something in the background that people can listen to, so it gives it again another dimension. Because I could do um, your typical matam, but with the crowd, I don't, I didn't know if it was going to work, especially with English. And it's you know the the, the the crowd are more suited to an Arab reciter, but um, I gave it a go for this added dimension of of the background instrumentals as well as reciting as a voiceover. That for me worked because again it gives another dimension. People were interested to hear this, this background voice of what these ahat was going on as well as my, my voiceover. So that was again something I tried to do to entice the English speaking audience, especially the youth. Uh, same thing for Sunday, uh, again I did another ahat instrumental background as well as, as well as me doing a voiceover but this time um, I wanted to obviously get the audience participation with the clapping but this time it was very much different because it wasn't the usual clapping it was a clapping to a certain tune then this name when they ask why Muhammad hey Muhammad ah, his character more than a school history learns from Muhammad 
It was very interesting because I had this fear that it wouldn't work out. And I didn't want to do the typical, you know, your rhythmic clapping. It was more along the lines of, I, I recite a couple of lines and then for their cue, the clapping was So it was a bit different. Within the second go of them doing it, they clicked on and they knew how to do it. And I was very excited, especially on stage. I was very excited because I was relieved that they could do it first time. And it didn't have to take them a couple of times or maybe they wouldn't even know how to do it. But underline, it very much worked for me, um, especially up on stage. I, stage, I could feel the vibrance of the youth. I could feel, because they put all the youth on the, on the front. So I can feel their vibrance, I can feel their energy, and I use that energy to harness that energy and give it back to them in English poetry and English recitations. It's a very much exciting night. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we are conducting our first workshop of the whole tour. Uh, it's called Muslim Motivation, in which uh, I'm going to be taking part, um, Brother Nuri Sardar and Brother Ali Nejef. It's a holistic approach to Muslim motivation through poetry and recitations and self-development. Um, I'll be taking care of the recitation side, so I'm going to start talking about motivation, what motivation is, um, defining motivation, what motivation means to the audience, and then how to channel that motivation into recitation. So you recite for the sake of the Ahlul Bayt. So if your motivation is for the Ahlul Bayt, to serve the Ahlul Bayt, then a channel towards serving is recitation and poetry. That's what we'll be covering today, inshallah. Um, and of course I did, I did another workshop as well with um, the youth ages 14 to 16, where we talked about various discussions. Um, of recitation and poetry and uh, really motivating them and cultivating their interests in, in whatever field they have. Now how to practice your pitch. Some people can do it naturally, but some people can't. And it really does take practice to reach a very high pitch and then go to a really low. It takes practice, you can't do it overnight. Now one of the exercises for, re for, for reaching these high pitches. Do you fear the feeling of feeling afraid? Do you fear the act of being betrayed? Do you fear a life lived in vain, or do you fear a substance that causes you pain? My name is Kazem Hassan, I'm from Virginia. And uh, this workshop session that I just attended with Nuri Sardar and Brother Ali Fadl and Brother Ali Najaf definitely opened my eyes up a little more. Um, as an aspiring young poet, I feel that looking up to others who do the same thing you do and are world, world renowned for it, uh, gives a lot of motivation <coughs> and inspiration for those looking to be and follow in their footsteps. I think this workshop helped in, uh, in a sense of getting uh, more interest and also developing a sense of uh, tips and practice and techniques for us to follow, for us to be just like them. I think poetry directed towards Ahlul Bayt is a very specific field. And although there are people who argue against that and say that poetry should be more of a broad and vast and secular topic and you know it has a deep meaning that can only be interpreted by so-and-so people, I think Poetry that's targeted just toward the Ahlul Bayt is a, is a form of service, is a form of worship. We do prayers, we do fasting, we do dua. I think poetry is another form of method of, in a way that we can express ourselves and express our love towards the Ahlul Bayt. And um, I think it should be very much promoted. I think it should very much be uh, <clears throat> practiced. And Brother Nuri Sadara and Brother Ali Fadl uh, definitely come in places like here like Ummah and inspire young people just like me and just like all the people that attended this workshop to go ahead and encourage in writing poetry and reciting poetry and use that form of worship in uh, praise of the Ahlul Bayt. As a last comment, I would say that for anyone interested in going into poetry and, and investing their time into writing, I would say go for it and don't stop. There's nothing you can do that is wrong. Poetry doesn't have a wrong answer. There's no wrong choice you can make in it. Whatever you say is your creative mind and your heart spilling out onto a piece of paper. And there's going to be a listener for you. So I say, by all means, go for it. And assalamu alaikum. We are to meet God as ourself. The only fear I should feel is the fear of God himself. Send, send, send that is wrong quick. These are the words written in tears. Let them to you paint an image. When Jabba comes to kill and die, which body does he first visit?
heart that reside inside my soul And each one wants to things different How can I love intertwined flames Yet their own bodies lie separate Between the Saifa and Marwa Enchained in a painful moment Hussein calls for him whilst Abbas Cries for the women in the tents Both voices break apart his mind What lies left by is trampled the other's voice never ending forgive me master i failed for say